You are listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. Welcome to this episode of CEO Perspectives, a signature webcast and podcast series by the Conference Board. CEO Perspectives are conversations that take an objective, nonpartisan look at a range of timely topics that matter most to business leaders. To help make sense of these topics and how they'll unfold, we'll sit down with experts and do what we do best at the conference board, provide trusted insights for what's ahead. I'm Steve Odlin, the CEO of this series and the conference board. And with the midterm elections quickly approaching, we're going to discuss an issue at the heart of a lot of redistricting debates, gerrymandering. What is it? How does it work? Is it causing a surge of extremism in politics? And what does it mean for the November elections? Joining me today is Mike Archbold, the founding CEO and board member of the Council for Inclusive Capitalism at the Vatican. He's the former CEO of GNC Holdings, a program director here at the conference board and a strong defender of democracy. He serves on the Sustaining Democratic Institutions Committee, and he is a trustee of the Committee for Economic Development. Mike, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Steve. Glad to be here. So, Mike, uh, gerrymandering was actually named after Eldridge Gary, G-E-R-R-Y. I guess it should be called gerrymandering, right? But talk about who was uh, Eldridge Gary and how did all of this start? Well, it, it, it goes back a ways. It goes back to the founding of our country. So, in fact, uh, Eldridge Gary was actually one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. So... Uh, uh, he then went on to become the governor of Massachusetts and was, was ultimately the vice president um, where he served under Madison. So the, the salient point of what happened in his career that led to this so-called gerrymandering, gerrymandering, right, is, is uh, the time that he spent as governor of Massachusetts. Um, and when he was governor of Massachusetts, the legislature under his direction Uh, approved a new state Senate district map. And it was designed to keep the controlling party in control. Um, Interestingly enough, that that controlling party at the time was called the the Democratic Republicans. Um, By today's standards, that's an oxymoron, but okay, but that's what they were. So, but in order to keep his, uh, his party in control, they redistricted. And it was said at the time, and I'll share my screen here. It was said at the time that the, the district was, was so strangely shaped that it resembled what was a mythical creature, a mythical type of salamander. So they wound up referring to it as the gerrymander. So that's how the, the name gerrymander ultimately came to, to be. And we still know it today as being this um, kind of abusive use of the redistricting in order to create a desired outcome. Yeah. And so this mythical creature was kind of in the shape of the new district map that that uh, Eldridge Gary drew, which was kind of a weird shape because they were kind of blocks before that made more sense. Um, you know, how does it work now in practice? How, how do politicians gerrymander or draw these districts? And what are the pros and cons of this process? So um, so there's there's a lot to unpack there. So so let's talk about it. So if we go back to what was really contemplated by the, the founding fathers, the apportionment or the the districting and the setting up of these these districts was really left to the states to determine. Um, The constitution is relatively silent on how to do it, but it was all based upon really the the simple concept that the entire republic was based on, which was one person, one vote, right? So what's happened now, it's actually become a very, very serious issue. And in fact, it's really practiced by both parties. And that's one of the things that were that really is important to take away from this conversation, that it, it is practiced by both parties. Um, and so therefore it is a, a bipartisan sin, if you will, right? And it is so insidious because it, it undermines our very republic. But unfortunately, many Americans don't even understand its impact. So nothing seems to ever get done about it. Um, it's all just played by the insiders w- within politics. And it often sounds so confusing because there's actually a number of court cases that have been involved in it. Um, And then, of course, you know, when people start having to bring on constitutional attorneys and talk about Supreme Court rulings, everything just seems to to get lost. But 
what, what I think it's important for us to focus on today is boiling down to its most simple level, which is it undermines that very most basic democratic value that exists in our constitution and our form of republic, one person, one vote. Um, one of the things I can do is I can share an example and actually to their credit, Wikipedia does a really nice job of explaining this. It just shows a, a random district or a number of districts, right? So there's, there's actually 50 different voting precincts, but what has to happen is they're charged with coming up with five districts and 10 precincts per district, because the one thing that most of the courts have ruled is they should be equal. And about these days, every person, every representative in Congress represents in excess of 700,000 voters. So what happens is we, we divide them up into the precincts, the precincts get divided into districts, right? So in this example here, we've got the districts that are 60% blue and 40% yellow. So you would think that at the end, we would have something that would look similar to that, right? But through the art of gerrymandering, you can wind up with lots of different outcomes. So for instance, if you actually divvy it up just right, where you wind up with you know, 60% blue and 40% yellow in each one of them, you can wind up with five blue districts and zero yellow districts. And we're using blue, we're using yellow, so we're not, we're, we're not taking sides here. This is, a, again, it's a, a bipartisan sim, right? So you could wind up in a scenario where you wind up with five blue districts where the yellows are actually, they don't matter at all. And that's where the problem comes in is when someone's vote doesn't matter. Now, because districts are supposed to be contiguous and right, what winds up happening is the, the districts get drawn with some looser uh, parameters. It's supposed to be done based upon geographical boundaries, um, uh, racial qualities, ethnicities, so, so that you wind up with people with similar interests that would be able to uh, elect a person that would represent them best when it comes to the, to the House of Representatives. There's two things that, that people talk about when they, when they do these districting maps. One is called cracking and one is called packing, right? So if you look at the cracking, what you wind up doing is you wind up divvying up the one that you want to minimize and you just put a little bit into a number of places so that they don't overwhelm. And then where you have to, with what's left, you pack them and you put all of the, the, the targeted group into one, one or two or three remaining districts so that you wind up shifting the balance. So in this case, in the two cases you have here, you have all blue, which doesn't represent what we, we saw, and you have three yellow, two blue, which is actually the inverse of what these represent. So there's lots of ways of actually abusing the process to get the desired type of outcome. So now proportionate outcomes, you could come up with, with lots of different ways, right? So again, you could literally just have them be all blues and all yellows, but unfortunately that's not how our neighborhoods really set up. So it's just not feasible to come up with that. So to be realistic, you take a reasonable approach and you do divide them up, but in the end where you wind up with three blue, two yellow, and you've got somewhere it's 50-50, you've got somewhere yellow actually exceeds blue, and you wind up with three blue, two yellow, which interestingly enough, on balance, represents the population that you're trying to create. So again, it, it, there's, there's these harsh practices that wind up uh, abusing the, the mapping process. And you know, if, if taken to its extreme, now let's take it to, to a real one, right? So after the 2010 census, um, Pennsylvania 7, was, was drawn with, up with new district maps. And believe it or not, that was actually the redistricting map that, that they came up with. So, so clearly it, it doesn't take, you know, someone with, with a rocket science degree to, to figure out that that's probably not the, the best way that we could have divided it up, but that's what they wound up doing. Um, and this became so comical that uh, a, a local papers actually ran a name that district uh, contest someone came up with the idea that in fact, it represented goofy kicking Donald. But, but in the end, the, the biggest challenge that we have here is that you can wind up taking a minority, typically a minority group. And, and by I mean minority, it could be you know, just the other party. I don't necessarily mean racial, ethnic or otherwise, but you can take the group that you are targeting and minimize their vote so that they actually don't count. So, so let's back up just a second. So, yes. so basically, Congress decides 
how many uh, representatives each state gets is what you're saying. And then you, the, those, the, you say you get five districts or you get five seats. And, and then roughly you, you have to put about the same n- amount number of people. And so around 700,000 on average. And so what you're saying is that in these states, if it's uh, a state controlled by one party, they could draw these things in all sorts of wacky ways in order to favor their party, even if the population doesn't represent the parties in that way. I, that's essentially what you're saying. And so basically, you know, in the minds of a lay person, it, it's an abuse of you know the system because you're you're drawing it you know not to represent the way the people are are split out in you know the, in the party representation but the way you want it to to end up I, I guess that's and and then you come up with these wacky things so this has been this has been done um, by both sides as you said and you know you and I've been reading this stuff for years and it's always one article uh, you know from one side and an, an article from the other side and they're both pointing fingers. You said this has been going on since the Madison uh, administration, but is it worse today? I mean, it just it feels like this is happening, you know, all over. And and it just doesn't feel like, you know, we're quite as representative as we used to be. Uh, yes. So so agreed. So you, you've summarized it much better than I have. And that, that's great. But it but it is, in fact, getting worse because y- you have a number of things that happen here um, y- when you wind up with a majority control at a state level then what happens is that that state uh, legislature generally controls this redistricting. So you've got blue states that control the redistricting in those blue states and red states in the red states. And when they control and they're in the majority, what they do is they use it to their advantage. And when they do that, they, they minimize the, the alternate party, right? Um, it, it actually re- reminds me of a, a horrible admonition going back to also um, the early uh, 19th century, Alexis de Tocqueville actually talked about the, the greatest risk that, that we had as a nation when he looked at democracy in America and said that the tyranny of the majority was the, the single biggest risk that, that he foresaw. And he, uh, the quote that I actually grabbed from him, he wrote, if ever the free institutions of America are destroyed, that event may be attributed to the unlimited power of a majority. And so this is where the unlimited power of a majority at a state level winds up creating these kinds of um, hyper-partisan conversations. What's, what's interesting is, is folks will point out, gee, well, it still winds up somehow being balanced in, in the house, so it must be okay. But the, the problem is it's not because it, just because both sides cheat to offset each other and they both cheat just as much, and we wind up neutralizing each other, that's not a better outcome. Because what happens is each one of those districts has a disproportionate representation. So their their votes are not being uh, counted. They don't count, right? So, So there's a lot of focus on counting votes, but this is where the votes really don't matter. And you will hear people, the electorate talk about that. My vote doesn't matter because, right? So, so this, this is something that really needs to be addressed because if a couple of things happen here, which is when you wind up with these, these um, partisan gerrymanders, uh, so the minority voice doesn't need to be listened to, which means that the fringes within the party become all the more louder, all the more relevant. So whether it's whether it's the, the Democrats or the Republicans, it becomes the fringes of the party that become the ones that set the agenda and it pulls at the edges. It is largely a very significant contributing factor to why we are uh, dealing with such extremes right. in our political environment these days. But what's happening is we're leaving out all of the people in the middle. Yeah, and we're going to come back to that in a moment. We've talked about the history of gerrymandering dating back to Eldridge Gary and the ways that mainstream political parties are using this, both of them, to their own gain. Next, we're going to explore some of the outcomes of this partisanship. We're going to take a break and be right back. As war rages in Ukraine, the Conference Board is closely monitoring the situation and producing timely and relevant content on a daily basis that will help the business community navigate this global geopolitical unrest. What will the impact be on oil prices, food prices, our supply chain, and what about cybersecurity? How will this conflict impact the way your organization does business around the world 
And how will you communicate this crisis to customers and employees? We're gathering the very latest content on our website. Just head to conference-board.org and find trusted insights to help you and your team lead with confidence. Welcome back to CEO Perspectives. I'm your host, Steve Odlin, the CEO of the Conference Board, and I'm joined today by Mike Archbold, the CEO for Council, uh, the founding CEO of the Council for Inclusive Capitalism, former CEO of GNC. Mike, uh, you were just talking before the break about you know, how this has helped the extremes. Let's go a little bit more into that. Because on one hand, I, I think what you said was, even if across the country, so if you took the, the nation as a whole, even if there's the right, you know, the, the, let's just say that the country is split half uh, in one party, half in the other party. And, and therefore, if we have half the representatives from one party one and, and half from the other party, you say the outcome's fine. But it may be that, you know, in red states, you get a ton of extra red representatives. And in blue states, it's just the opposite. So you're not really getting the participation or the votes aren't, quote unquote, counting uh, in in each of those areas, but but the extremism part that you re- referred to is is even more worrying. Talk more about that. So there, there's there's a lot of um, unfortunate outcomes that that happen with this. So the most nefarious outcome that that comes from it is is really that in trying to give their party an advantage and doing what they think is the right thing to do, it does give that disproportionate weight to the extremes within their own party while disenfranchising the, the moderates. And, and by the way, virtually ignoring independence, right? They, so, so they are, are literally left out of the conversation. So what happens is when, when a seat becomes safe, right? So, so that it, if it's gerrymandered to the point where whatever happens, whoever wins on, whether it's a, if, let's say it's a democratic um, seat, whoever wins the primary is guaranteed to win the election. Same is true if it's a Republican seat, whoever wins the primary is guaranteed to win the election. So what happens is then the power shifts away from the people who they're supposed to be representing to the party leaders. So let's give an example, like the party leaders may come to this representative and say, look, if you don't fall in line on this vote that we need, right, then we may support someone else the next time this comes up in the next primary, which ensures that you lose the seat, right? Because whoever they support is where the money's gonna go, uh, it's where they're gonna get the line on on the machine and they're going to get elected because once you win the primary, you wind up winning that election. And the way that works is if if you've got, you know, 70% of the voters in a district that is, you know, either 70% Democrat or 70% Republican, this is where the primary you're saying becomes really the thing because it's going to you know you know it's going to be a republican or a democrat and so what happens is you know the the moderate then gets you know someone from the left if you're on the democrat side or on the right if you get if you're on the republican side who runs against and so you get further and you know you get these these further and further left and right folks i and i think that's what you're saying so therefore the polarization happens because people are further and further to the extreme of their party, right? Because they don't have to represent everybody because it's a safe district. Right, exactly, exactly. Because the, the, the end result is that th- those loudest voices within the party, within that district, are the voices that get heard, right? So so they wind up beca- becoming very polarized. So we wind up with this these uh, elected leaders who then wind up falling in line and having to push themselves to the right or the left because that is where their their party leaders are 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 pushing them. Now you got an example of this, I think. So yes, and again, I point out this is a bipartisan sin. So I use use Republican uh, examples. I use Democratic examples. If we look at the state of New York, right? So the state of New York, well known to be a a Democratic leaning state, and in the 2020 presidential election. Well, 60 to 38 Democrat versus Republican. So, okay, it gives you a grounding for, for what the state really is like for, for those who actually get out and vote, okay? In the last uh, election for governor, um, and we're talking about New York, so we won't even talk about the who, but uh, we've got the, the 60% and 30%. So it's still very consistent, 60% Democratic. So the Republican was less in that one. But what's interesting is the current House representatives are 70-30. It becomes very skewed because when it is controlled by the same party who draws the maps, 
they can control the outcome or at least put a finger on the scale, right? In order to uh, create the outcome that they want. And they do that by cracking and packing the districts so that they get the desired outcome. But what's interesting is uh, New York State actually has put forward a, a new map, um, which actually has been contested in the courts and is, is being challenged. Um, and we'll see how that plays out. And that's part of a, a, a big initiative that's going on now, but we can come back to that. But if that map comes out, it's estimated that the proposed house would be 85% Democrat and 15% Republican. So that clearly is such a far cry from the, the true electorate, which is looking like 60 versus 38. And most interesting is if you actually look at the voter rolls for the state of New York, and you actually look at the electorate and how they actually uh, are categorized, it's 53% Democrat, 28% Republican, 19% that show is not affiliated. So uh, it's not independent, it's not affiliated. New York has a, a uh, transition they're going through. Technically, New York calls them blanks, which I think is actually offensive, but okay, let's come back to that. But the end result, you've got uh, 53 percent of the electorate being democratic and 85 percent of the elected leaders or the the seats would become democratic and of course this this can happen in the inverse in a you know in a largely red state yes and and i have i had an example in here earlier i could show you the same thing in texas doing exactly the opposite so again this is this is not attacking either party um, and you know, one party saying that that the other does it more, or that we do it less, or whatever. It's whenever they're in control, they do it, and that's there lies the problem. Yeah, they both and both sides do it. And this, you're talking about the U.S. House of Representatives, but this happens also in the state houses and and uh, for local elections. So you know, the ripple effect, you know, through all of this is is quite substantial in the political. Absolutely. Process. Absolutely. Realm, right? So, so it, yeah. it's it's happening, and and there's different districts, obviously, for at a at a state level versus the federal level. So we've really just focused on the the federal in terms of the House of Representatives yeah. for this, but you know, just building on, on that, you know, the, the the point before. So this this is actually being challenged. The New York State map is being challenged, right? But um, you know, again, this is being challenged across the country, which is which is showing progress because over the past several months, uh, you know. In Maryland, a state judge actually threw out a congressional map that was drawn by Democrats citing, quote, an extreme gerrymander. In North Carolina, the state Supreme Court in February struck down maps drawn by Republicans. And in New York State, I mentioned about New York State being challenged, a, the state, a state judge ruled that a map drawn by Democrats had been, quote, unconstitutionally drawn with political bias, unquote. So this is this is this is when you know the, the states are stepping in. Now the good news is th this is. This is a crack in the arm and this is an opportunity. This is where we can actually make a difference. So because this is committed by, by both parties, we can't reasonably expect our legislators who are seated in these seats to be working against their own best interest and setting up the, the maps and doing the maps for themselves, right? If, if this were business and you know the conference board and CED are nonpartisan business led boards, the, the business folks would quickly say, this represents a conflict of interest and therefore you shouldn't do it. And in a business environment, you would say, okay, we need an independent group to do it. Aha, we do need an independent group to do it. And therein lies the challenge. Now, to be fair, there are 10 states that have actually put in independent commissions that are uh, actually going after and creating these apportionments, these districts. And they're doing it based upon the criteria that, they're, that they've been established, which is to come up with something that represents the electorate, to take into account the things that they need to take into account, race, ethnicity, geography, things like that, and try and make it as contained, contiguous uh, as, as possible. And it can be done, and it is being done. Um, you know, I would say that there are a number of other states that purport to have independent commissions, but then the independent commissions are appointed by the elected leaders. So you wind up much in the same place. But, but we can be making a lot of progress here um, if we all keep pushing to, to make a difference here. So, so it sounds like you're, what you're saying is don't, don't just let the, the governing political party of a state deal with this because it's going to be too skewed one way or the other, but, but go to more independent commissions that are balanced between the parties. Is that, the, is that 
the, the other consideration? Yes, it, it should be balanced between the parties and, and it can't be party blind because it, it has to actually realize that in the end, you want to come out with something that represents that electorate. So, so you don't want it to be- yeah, It represents the state. Yeah, and, and so who should appoint those, those commission members? So um, th there's a number of ways that have been done it. Some of some of the states that have done it have done it with with a kind of a judicial oversight, with nominations that come from the the elected leaders or from other sources, and then they they pick them based upon the their history. They they have set up criteria that say they have either never been or some say they haven't sat in in an elected office in X number of years. Or some states have said, and if you do this, you can't run for an elected office for X number of years. So there, there's a number of ways of doing it to, to keep it more independent than it is now. So, and anything would represent progress. So the point is to try to get people who are objective, who draw the districts that are contiguous, that are more compact, that kind of represent the areas, but that are balanced and made up of, you know, the, the sort of the proportions of the, the people who live there. And if you did that, then the representative, what I heard, if I tie it back to what you were saying originally, theoretically, then the representatives who live or who represent that district would have would represent and want votes from both sides, Democrats and Republicans, and therefore be more moderate or more centrist than, you know, somebody who had a safe seat and had to, you know, appeal only to one side. Is that it? And so therefore, it sounds to me like if we followed your methodology, we would have a House of Representatives, we'd have a government in Washington, and presumably state governments that would be, that would be, you know, wouldn't be fighting with each other so much, they would be a little bit more balanced, a little bit more centrist, and, uh, you know, maybe we get more done. Uh, agreed all around. So, you know, I would say, you know, in many respects, we, we've not lived up to to John Adams hopes when, when, when he wrote that a representative assembly should be in miniature, an exact portrait of the people at large. It should think, feel, reason and act like them. And I think, you know, if if we look at what we have created today, I can think we can safely say we've not we've not lived up to that ideal that he has painted for us. A republic if you can keep it. A republic if you can keep it, ma'am, right, exactly. Mike Archibald, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Steve, it's been a pleasure. And thanks to all of you for listening in to CEO Perspectives. Every week I'll be joined by a prominent thought leader to provide insights on the issues of our time. We'll cover leading topics in geopolitics, economics, public policy, ESG, human capital, and more. Please share CEO Perspectives with all of your colleagues, your friends, your enemies, your family, anybody who will listen. I know that they'll want to watch and hear us. I'm Steve Odlin, and this series has been brought to you by the Conference Board. You've been listening to a podcast from the Conference Board, your source of trusted insights for what's ahead. For the latest insights to help guide your business through this time of geopolitical unrest, we have daily and relevant updates on our website at conference-board.org.